He spent last year as a visiting scholar at Duke Divinity School, uh, uh, where he was doing research on his current project, which focuses on the opioid epidemic. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Schumann. Thank you. Uh, I was trying to decide about PowerPoint. Uh, when theologians do PowerPoint, it's usually data envy <laughs> or, or uh, finding something to do instead of grading undergraduate writing. <laughs> Uh, I tell my students I use PowerPoint to goof off, to show off, or to keep them awake. So I, perhaps the same thing can be said of this. The opioid crisis has been with us long enough to have been recognized by some as a wicked problem. The word wicked here indicates difficulty rather than malevolence. A wicked problem is one so socially complex that it defies adequate uh, description, much less straightforward solution. Mm, Connie, <laughs> formatting. <laughs> the recognition of a problem as wicked typically emerges over time as initial descriptions and their attendant solutions overlook less than obvious details and generate unintended consequences. These undesirable outcomes evoke further descriptions, themselves partial, which generate still further unintended consequences. To call the opioid crisis a wicked problem is not to ascribe blame or failure to antecedent efforts to address it, but to confess its difficulty and the need for creative responses, perhaps including an overarching narrative that seeks to make sense of the problem's complexity while still valuing the variety of existing attempts to describe and address it. In what follows, I'll suggest that a sense-making narrative of the sort I'm talking about may be crafted from the language of the Christian theological tradition. Further, I'll suggest that Christianity at its best offers important resources for responding to, albeit not solving, the opioid crisis by serving those the crisis has stricken. This service, which may take any number of particular forms, will always be a concrete expression of the neighbor love that Jesus of Nazareth named as one of the two great mandates upon all which else pertaining to human flourishing hinges. Very briefly and necessarily simplistically, I want to describe three ways of seeing the opioid crisis, each of which speaks by omission or commission to some of the particular social forces at its foundation. I'll go on to suggest that each of these descriptions implicates important questions about the human condition, something about which Christianity has, said, has had a few things to say, some of them fairly interesting. I'll go on to offer a brief theological account of how the opioid crisis may be understood in light of the Christian account of the human condition, and conclude by sketching some elements of a practical Christian response that takes seriously the social dimensions of both the phenomenon of addiction and the crisis itself. One way of seeing the opioid crisis is as the most recent chapter of America's decidedly ambiguous relationship to intoxicants. While there's nothing exceptional about the American attraction to intoxicants, that attraction is exceptionally fraught. This anxiousness runs deep and dates at least to the earliest days of westward expansion when westward meant Ohio and Indiana. Near the beginning of the 19th century, the religious movement now called the Second Great Awakening began its sweep across the company, country. Preachers of the movement decried alcohol as a great social evil, and abstinence became a litmus test for membership in many post-revival churches. The awakening was a vital force in antebellum social reform, including the then nascent temperance movement. Although the revivalist heritage of the temperance movement was muted with the passing of time, its adherents maintained the zeal of their forebears and were instrumental in the 1920 passing of the 18th Amendment, more commonly known as Prohibition. 
Although alcohol abuse was indisputably a significant and growing social concern by the end of the 19th century, prohibition turned out to be a hot mess of unintended consequences. After 13 years, it was declared a failure and overturned, yet its core suppositions that the use and abuse of intoxicants was primarily a, fa a matter of moral failure best addressed by legislation and law enforcement re remain very much alive. The relatively obscure Federal Bureau of Narcotics, which was founded in 1930 to consolidate various agencies that had been formed in the 1910s, to enforce new laws restricting or outlawing opiates and coca derivatives was combined with other agencies in 1973 to form the Drug Enforcement Agency, which became a key element in President Nixon's 1972 War on Drugs. From its roots in the first decades of the 20th century, the War on Drugs kept alive the crusading spirit of prohibition. It was, and to an extent remains, not simply moralistic, but tinged by race, class, and ethnic bigotries, preying on white middle-class America's deepest prejudices about black and brown criminality, juvenile delinquency, and class warfare. Beyond its stigmatizing addiction as immoral and criminal and its role in the appalling mass incarceration of young black men, the war on drugs has been a practical failure re replicating the unintended consequences of prohibition on a scale several times long larger. This is to not to deny the existence of so-called drug-related crime, but to suggest that much of that crime is an epiphenomenon of framing substance abuse disorder in terms of immorality and illegality. Policy, legislation, and law enforcement have legitimate roles in addressing the opioid crisis, but those roles will look very different when the crisis is framed not simply as more than a law enforcement problem, but in many or most respects as other than such a problem. And as we've heard, that terrain has begun to shift, but it's so, the, the, those notions are, remain so deeply seated that they're not going away anytime soon. The thing that most obviously separates the opioid crisis from other substance abuse problems is, the, is that the opioid crisis implicates the institution and the practice of medicine, which is to say that the drugs to which many people first became addicted were legally prescribed. The medical roots of the crisis have two particular foci, the first of which may be described as a case of big pharma run amok. While the popular conception of the pharmaceutical industry as mostly malign may well be exaggerated, reports of wrongdoing are sufficiently frequent and troubling to sustain it, with the story of the opioid epidemic being a case in point. Presumably everyone here knows by now the story of OxyContin and its manufacturer, Purdue, Purdue Pharmaceutical, which I won't bother to recount in any detail. Dr. Arthur Van Zee has called OxyContin a commercial success and a public health disaster, which pretty well captures the history of the drug. It was marketed especially to primary care physicians by sales representatives who use specious data and ill-conceived expert opinions to support their marketing efforts. When these physicians and the public health officials in the places they, their, their pra they practiced, excuse me, became alarmed at what was happening to their patients and their patients' neighbors, their concerns were summarily dismissed. Eventually, advocates and activists found a sympathetic ear since 2003 a series of criminal and civil actions have been filed against Purdue and other drug companies. As of now, there are more than 1,000 civil and criminal cases being prepared or prosecuted by state and local attorneys from across the country. These legal actions were accompanied by policy level responses beyond the courts. In 2016, the CDC published new opioid prescribing guidelines for treating chronic pain. While the new guidelines contributed to a significant decline in opioid prescription rates, they fell well short of resolving the crisis. Overdose deaths remained at an alarmingly high level, 
increasing in many places, even as the life-saving overdose treatment naloxone has become more widely available. Although there are several factors involved in this shift and in the increase in overdoses, the most obvious is one of simple microeconomics. As the available supply of diverted pills dwindled and prices rose, more people with opioid abuse disorder turned to heroin, which tends to be unpredictably strong, as we've heard, and often laced with fentanyl, and so much more lethal. As convenient as it might be to attribute the opioid crisis to corporate malfeasance and regulatory negligence, the truth, of course, is not that simple. That Purdue's marketing strategy targeted clinicians who were already prescribing opioids suggests that the company didn't create a mar market for OxyContin so much as it exploited and cultivated an opportunity that developed alongside shifts in the way clinicians were taught to think about and treat pain. That shift, about which a great deal can be said, was one part of a broader cultural phenomenon known as medicalization. I understand medicalization as the propensity to identify more and more of life's difficulties as medical problems, to expect medicine to address them, and frequently to blame medicine for its inability or its reticence to do so. Medicalization emerged with force over the last third of the 20th century, partly as a matter of medicines becoming a victim of its own successes, but also in response to steadily expanding patient expectation and demand. Gerald McKinney has argued that contemporary medicine has been thoroughly shaped by what he calls the Baconian project. The Baconian project is a medical and cultural ethos stemming from two sources. The first of these is the intellectual legacy of the new philosophy described by the 16th and 17th century British statesman and philosopher Sir Francis Bacon. Bacon claimed that true science, by which he meant all knowledge producing inquiry, has to serve the expansion of human control over the natural world, and this solely for the purpose of improving the human estate and relieving human suffering. The second source of the Baconian project is modern political philosophy. Here McKinney follows Charles Taylor, who points to elements of the romantic reaction to the Enlightenment of the late 18th and early 19th centuries, converging with the rights language of classical political liberalism to produce an assumption that each individual is the architect of his or her own life, not simply free but responsible to determine its course and ends. Under the aegis of the Baconian project, McKinney says, suffering comes increasingly to be identified as any unhappy contingency that threatens or obstructs the pursuit of my particular self-defined and self-determined ends. Technologies, medicine chief among them, become instruments to facilitate that pursuit. Suffering is whatever I say it is. I have a nearly absolute right to seek relief from it, and medicine has what comes eventually to be understood as a moral obligation to provide that relief. Against this backdrop, what was called the patient rights movement transmogrifies into a kind of consumer populism. Patients come to understand themselves as consumers and the goods and service of medicine as desirable commodities. This is a perspective facilitated by the ongoing corporatization of medicine. The emergence of managed care in the 1980s accelerated the introduction of the principles of scientific management into the clinical setting. That created a tacit pressure for clinicians to begin to think of themselves and their work in terms of efficient production. Hospitals and clinics began calling patients consumers, asking them to complete satisfaction surveys while patients began writing and publishing Yelp-like reviews of physicians and hospitals on various social media platforms. 
All of this helped shape the ways the new pain doctrine was received and implemented. Pain relief becomes a desirable commodity, medicine its purveyor, and narcotics the most efficient technique for delivering it in the short term. Each of these accounts, oh, <laughs> gotta throw a French fry in the slide there. Each of these accounts of the opioid crisis implicates elemental questions about our humanity. What we desire, what for whom we fear, what we hope for, what we expect, and what we think we owe and to whom. Questions like this are best raised and discussed against the background of a narrative description of the human condition, such as the one afforded by Christian theology. Any theological consideration of human well-being must include, if not begin, with an acknowledgement of the fundamental goodness of material creation and our creaturely existent as bodies. Whatever it is that distinguishes humans from other creatures cannot dispense with the more obvious reality that we are members of creation among many, many others. The gift of human life is predicated upon human embodiment with all of its attendant connections and limitations. The creation stories of the First Testament posit the earth as the source and destiny of human life. Humankind comes from the earth, is sustained by its connections to the earth and its creatures, and eventually declines, dies, and returns to the earth. This pattern is not merely to be endured, but embraced, for creation is beloved by God, who has seen and declared it very good. As Wendell Berry, drawing from the deepest roots of biblical tradition, puts this, the world was created and approved by love. It subsists, coheres, and endures by love, and insofar as it is redeemable, it can be redeemed only by love. Divine love, incarnate and indwelling in the world, summons the world always toward wholeness. The goodness of the material creation and the steadfastness of God's love for it are confirmed throughout Christian scripture, perhaps most remarkably in the prophetic vision that the good future God promises is a fully embodied life in a peaceable new creation. Although God has seen and declared the phenomenon of life very good, we experience it as such inconsistently. The philosopher Alistair McIntyre says that precisely because we are animals, which is to say bodies, we are fragile, vulnerable to affliction or exploitation, and inherently dependent, sometimes conspicuously so. This means that our lives are subject to unfortunate contingency and apt to include pain and suffering. But it also means that we are inescapably social, always and everywhere bound to others in relationships of depending and being depended upon, of being burdens and bearing the burdens of others. This is complicated, though, by the not quite rightness of creation as we experience it. Insofar as creation is somehow off kilter, our inherent fragility and vulnerability are magnified, as is our susceptibility to pain and suffering. We sense that things are neither as they could or should be, both with ourselves and the world we inhabit. Among humankind, creation's brokenness is manifest in our bent towards self-destruction which is the product of disordered and potentially bottomless desire that leads us restlessly to want things without restraint or consideration of their ability to harm us. Made for the love of God and neighbor, we are instead bound by an egotism that threatens, that treats all things as existing primarily for our gratification. Frequently, we regard these things with an ardor properly directed only toward God. Nicholas Lash describes this propensity saying, all human beings have their hearts set 
somewhere, hold something sacred, worship at some shrine. We are spontaneously idolatrous, whereby idolatry, I mean the worship of some creature, the setting of the heart on some particular thing, usually oneself. For most of us, there is no single creature that is the object of our faith. Our hearts are torn, dispersed, distracted, and none of us is so self-transparent as to know quite where, in fact, our hearts are set. This brokenness that bends us toward self-destruction and idolatry is at once characteristic of and exacerbated by the dissolution of our intrinsic sociality, the rupture of the human family, the communion for which we have been made so integral to the peace of creation has been corrupted, and women and men are scattered into ever-deepening estrangement characterized by selfishness, mutual suspicion, exploitation, hostility and violence, and perhaps worst of all, loneliness. This is how the sages of the Eastern Church describe what Latin-speaking Christians have called the fall. The human family has gone missing and in its stead is an aggregation of isolated, self-interested individuals whose associations tend to be chosen according to the dictates of mutual self-interest. In this state, Vulnerability, fragility, and conspicuous dependence are not simply facts of our human animality, but dangerous and potentially tragic liabilities. These tightly articulated descriptions of the human condition suggest ways of thinking about addiction that refuse to reduce it either to freely willed moral failure or to disease whose treatment is the purview of medicine alone. Insofar as the human condition entails egotism and its attendant disordering of loves, it always implicates the possibility of idolatry. Egotism is not self-interestedness alone, but also, as Lash puts it, the inability or refusal to relate, to find one's place, to make one's contribution to the whole. The unquiet self, driven either to dominance or to self-destruction, knows no house, can find no resting place, no peace. Egotism, in the last resort, is the denial by the creature of its createdness. Just so, we may speak tentatively of the phenomenon of addiction using the language of lost connection, disordered love, and even idolatry. The theologian Kent Dunnington, drawing on the work of Thomas Aquinas, has suggested that addiction is a complex habit, meaning it involves more than one of the constituent principles of human action. He suggests that addiction may be interpreted, other, among other things, as a counterfeit form of worship. To see what he's getting at, it's important to see what he, following Aquinas, means by habit. Addiction so understood is neither freely chosen behavior nor a condition that deterministically just happens in the matter of an idiopathic illness. Two characteristics of habit are especially significant for our conversation. First, habits are stubborn to the point of intractability. They're products not simply of repeated voluntary action, but also history, disposition, and circumstance. Although habits are associated with rationality, they are not, especially when established, subject to rational de deliberation in any straightforward way. Unlike dispositions, which are subject to will and can be altered or abandoned volitionally, habits resist human volition. One cannot, through deliberate action, will oneself out of a habit. A principle for reason for this has to do with the second characteristic of habits, which is that they are mediated bodily. Within Aquinas' hylomorphic anthropology, reason and will do not exist apart from the body. 
They are functions of the neuromusculoskeletal system, including the neurochemistry of the brain. Just so there's no necessary contradiction between called, calling addiction a habit and understanding it as a disease. So in tentatively connecting addiction to worship, Dunnington is acknowledging its complexity, that it is in many respects a disease, but one that is at some level associated with human agency. Similarly to Lash, he maintains that all sin, whether or not it is freely chosen, is the effort to attain independently of God that flourishing integrity of self and delight that just is, in fact, right relationship with God. Worship as an embodied expression of our relationship to that which we most love is not voluntary in the strict sense, for the basic activity of worship, broadly construed, is simply a fact of our existence as desiring animals. Proper worship is not the elimination of desire, but it's gradual, ongoing purification. As Lash puts it, Christian discipleship, understood as obedience to the word made flesh, seeks not to stifle or suppress desire, but to free it from the chains which bind it in egotism's nervous and oppressive grasp. Learning to worship rightly is a part of the process of healing. Healing, which is making whole, entails reclaiming and remembering from the exile of loneliness. To be healed is to be gathered again into the communion for which we are made. Turning toward what we are made to be, members of one another. Wendell Berry asserts that the thing most often standing between sickness and healing is not disease, but despair, a wound that cannot be healed because it is encapsulated in loneliness, surrounded by speechlessness. He continues, healing is impossible in loneliness. It is the opposite of loneliness. Conviviality is healing. To be healed, we must come with all the other creatures to the feast of creation. Just so, an important and largely missing path toward healing the opioid crisis is connection, specifically friendship, which is morally serious business of the highest order. None of this should be construed as a dismissal or disparagement of professional and policy level responses to the opioid crisis, criminal justice reform, trauma-informed policing, harm reduction, comprehensive medical and psychological therapies are all indispensable. But none of these things, nor even all of them together, will resolve this crisis in the absence of extraordinary works of love performed by ordinary women and men. Most ordinary people who find the will to engage the opioid crisis do so not because it's a national or state or even a city problem. They become involved because it is a problem that is destroying their neighborhoods and their families. For those of us who are not policymakers, epidemiologists, clinicians, or therapists, our engagement with this crisis needs to begin at what Wendell Berry calls the scale of our competence, which is generally small. It exists at the level of neighborhoods and households and friendships. It depends primarily neither upon material resources nor professional expertise, but upon love. Love is never abstract. It's extended by and to particular people. The everyday character of love, says Barry, is not by its own desire heroic. It is heroic only when compelled to be. It exists by its willingness to be anonymous, humble, and unrewarded. Beyond the spheres of romance and familial affection, love appears to us most often clothed as friendship. Friendship is the mode of God's work in the world. Jesus called his disciples friends. Friends. 
And Thomas Aquinas said that love, the very form of the virtues, was nothing other than friendship with God. The creator and sustainer of heaven and earth, the beginning and end of all that it is, calls upon creatures to be, in a sense that defies comprehension, friends. Having befriended us, God then calls upon us to widen that circle of friendship by befriending others, especially those others most in need of healing love. What does this love look like? Well, I have a friend who says that if we really care about the poor, we'll know their names. That same truth can be extended to those who suffer the devastation of substance abuse disorder. To the extent that we really care about them, we'll know their names, which is to say that our lives and their lives will intersect. We will offer our presence. We will become part of their lives as we are invited and join them as friends while they struggle daily with the menace of addiction. Describing addiction as disease rather than moral failure is an important distinction, especially insofar as it keeps us from moralizing or victim blaming. But from the perspective of love, it is in some sense beside the point because love is tireless in tearing down distinctions between us and them the righteous and the unrighteous, the deserver and the undeserving, the givers and the takers. The philosopher Alistair McIntyre argues that all of us are in one way or another disabled. He says, different individuals disabled in different ways and degrees, can have their own peculiar talents and their own difficulties. Each, therefore, needs others to take note of her or his particular condition. And this is one of the points at which it is important to remember that there is a scale of disability on which we all find ourselves. Understanding the universality of disability and the attendant contingency of independence is an important step on the way to serving the victims of substance abuse disorder, wherever we may find them or wherever they may find us on their path to recovery. Friendships with these can and must take many forms. Andy knows more about this than I do. She lives it every day. From relationships based on simple quotidian gestures like offering rides or sharing meals to more involved efforts like providing housing, serving as advocates in court, or earning certification to become their peer recovery coaches. No matter what particular form these friendships take, they will always include the thing that all true friendships include. Careful listening, truthful speech, generous hospitality, and gracious, forgiving encouragement. All of which is to say that they will always participate in the healing love God has already extended, not simply to us, but to all creation. And there's <laughs> a, a PSA for the Holy Friendship Collaborative. Thank you. <laughs> Worship can, like, you know, maybe it's 
transformation an important aspect of worship in your kind of sort of theological understanding? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I, I think that, uh, I, I mean, the, the wor word worship is such a fascinating word. It, it means, etymologically, simply to ascribe worth to something, which is behind Lash's claim that, that all of us all the time are worshiping uh, because we bend our lives toward those things that we love most, uh, whether that is uh, an exogenous substance or a person or some created thing. Uh, and insofar as our lives are bent toward those things, they change us over time. Uh, I sometimes tell my undergraduates that, that we become what we love and who we hang out with who we spend time with. And of course, uh, that can be for ill or for good. And, and that spending time in the presence of other worshipers whose lives are bent toward uh, a God whose regard for them is absolutely benign, absolutely characterized by love, uh, should be transformative over time, incrementally, <laughs> Partially and imperfectly in this life, of course. Yes, sir. Um, I wanted to go back. Um, maybe this is probably an unfair question, um, but we've been thinking about it as a wicked problem. Reminded mm -hmm. me of what you said earlier about the role, perhaps, of things like childhood trauma. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and one imagines, you know, fairly deep wounds. Um, you know, in thinking about this in this kind of theological way, um, how, how, how does one, so that the healing isn't just that I'm unemployed, or, mm -hmm. you know, certain things that seem doable, <laughs> at least in theory, right? I mean, there might be serious of chronic unemployment and so on, but so it's not a, that doesn't make it simple, but there does seem to be a human dimension that makes mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. deeply complex and wicked and intense. And anyway, I wonder if you reflect on on that, and, and is there a way for that kind of healing of wounds that, that, that long predate the addiction mm -hmm. um, uh, in, in this theological model? Well, yes, but I'm not sure I can describe the mechanics of that. Uh, Certainly, the notion of, of, of reconciliation, uh, which is so intrinsic to a theological perspective on anything attending human life, is, a, is an important part of this. Uh, that those traumas that are caused by interpersonal kinds of relationships uh, and, and the, the kinds of ruptures and estrangement that those traumas have caused uh, Reconciliation is an important part of healing those, or, or and, and a reconciliation may, may, may or may not be full, uh, but one would hope that it moves toward our coming to terms with those things. Uh, and, and, and the other thing is that it acknowledges that. I, I think that uh, McIntyre's Dependent Rational Animals this has been such an important book uh, from my thinking about this, because it, it is this reminder that that uh, uh, the sentence there is a scale of disability on which we all find ourselves, and to be in the presence of of a community of people who whose existence is predicated on, on acknowledging that, such that uh, insofar as there is one person whose difference. Uh, sets them apart, uh, this acknowledgement that, that that's very contingent and that, that tomorrow it could be someone else who with a different way of being different that is setting them apart from the, from the, the rest of the community, uh, that, uh, that acknowledges the fragility and the difficulty of human life in general uh, and that allows members of the community to say, you know, this is not a person we are fixing or even this is not someone I'm saving or helping. This is someone with whom I'm entering into communion, entering into relationship, and together we're going to try to figure this thing out. Yes. On something Josh just said, and you talked about it earlier, I'm 
you were thinking about the theology and substance things, I start thinking about the situations where substances lead to uh, transcendental transformation, like Wasco and mm-hmm. NMDA and LSD and these kinds mm-hmm. of things. Do you, what, what was your take on that? I don't have one. Okay. I, I, no, I, I mean, I, it, it's really interesting that, that to, to look at the way uh, substances, by which we mean intoxicating substances, function within cultures uh, uh, that they are, they are used in, traditional, in many traditional cultures to facilitate uh, 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 relationship to the transcendent, for want of better language. Uh, they are used in many cultures to, to foster conviviality. Um, all intoxicating substances don't serve either of those ends. There are some that, that do not serve either of those ends. And then most uh, intoxicants, when used uh, intemperately, are, are destructive of those ends as well. Uh, so, so part of part of the abuse of substances is the the dissolution of the kind of communities within which their use was made intelligible in certain ways, mm-hmm. uh, as other than simply something that an individual individual takes to a, create their own reality, so to speak. <laughs> Those remarks really would apply to everyone I saw this morning, um, including me. And uh, <laughs> uh, but it's it's as physicians we realized that much later. One of my young physicians that I was at supervising was having difficulty uh, relating to an individual, and I could see what happened was they could not put themselves. They too mm-hmm. young to put themselves in in the situation of a care provider for an Alzheimer's patient because they haven't experienced what it means to be providing care for your spouse who's has Alzheimer's or something. But I think those are very universal remarks that you just made about if everyone we have it's it, those are apply to all at least diseases I take mm-hmm. care of. And it, th- it's easy to perpetuate perpetuate a kind of an illusion to the contrary in a, in a society like ours where uh, the ways that uh, we are cared for is, is through uh, particular uh, uh, profession systems of exchange, uh, professionals, uh, so we leave our context to be cared for and return to it having been cared for by, by a professional. So uh, it's easy, oh, we're going to send you to be fixed, and then when you come back, you're back among us. And so, so we don't have the experience to the extent that maybe we once did of having the conspicuously dependent right in our midst all the time. to mm-hmm. enable people to enact friendship mm-hmm. um, rather than you know, simply the kind of processing of, of people. Yeah, I'm not going to walk down onto the, the town square in Wilkes-Barre, which at any given time, uh, there are a dozen or more people who are clearly uh, users sitting around and say, hi, I want to be your friend. Uh, that, uh, that wouldn't, <laughs> but, but that, I think that you, what you've just suggested Andy might, but but that what uh, I, th- I think you, you're, you're this intuition that agencies that can make connections like this can be really effective. Uh, there's a new recovery center uh, 
uh, in town. Uh, and in my bioethics course in the spring, students don't know this yet, but they're going to be spending time there. And, and they're going to be doing field research. And what they're going to be doing is, is teaching uh, people who are in recovery things like how to put together a resume, how to dress for an interview, uh, how to how to, to to write a letter, how to how to communicate in a professional setting, uh, to sit down and have meals with them, and just as a way of making commu making connections that are fundamentally practical, I think is a, a starting place for this, and then see where it goes. I mean, this is not a solution to the opioid problem; it's a way of responding yeah. to it out of the most fundamental convictions we have. Sir? Um, I had a brief uh, comment about the, about the intoxicating, or just a thought about the intoxicating substance question and spirituality. I mean, uh, the thought was just, I have a question, so the thought was that, in, at least in Catholic theology, God makes, makes, takes flesh, so to speak, in the world as an intoxicating substance. That's, <laughs> that is unusual. But uh, maybe it just suggests that there's a deeper connection here, or that's a longer-term connection than, uh, right. than you only find in... But th so the question, however, is, is unfortunately much drier. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so to speak, I guess... But anyway, never mind. <laughs> uh, is, I was interested in your connection between addiction and habit. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering how to, how to map those two... Is, hot, is habit for Aquinas or for you or for the, t the fellow you were citing? Is habit a more general concept and addiction is a species of habit, or... We usually, as you said, you usually think of habits as things that we develop by voluntary action, but does, ha does is addiction kind of a sort of thing that helps us realize that habits are embodied and addiction sort of has this stronger embodied sense than like the habit of courage or the habit of loving my wife or whatever. Mm -hmm. Anyway, if you could just uh, help us a little bit more, more map how addiction falls into the category of habit or how it relates to the idea. Yeah, this taxonomy of action. <laughs> some things, just something yeah. I can see where they had a... Well, a disposition <laughs> is uh, what, what we typically colloquially call habits. Uh, Aquinas would call it dispositions. It, it's, it's the tendency to do things in the same way over and again. Often we have dispositions that we're not aware of, but when someone calls their attention, calls our attention to them, uh, and particularly if it's an annoying or socially awkward one, we can say, oh, I didn't know I was doing that. Mm -hmm. I'll stop now. <laughs> or we can readily retrain ourselves to stop. Um, addiction is, is much more profound, or not addiction, habit is much more profound, uh, first of all, because it is a function of uh, contingency. It's a function of circumstance, of our history, of past traumas, and it's also bodily mediated, mm -hmm. so that uh, uh, it changes our bodies. Uh, it changes our brains. Mm -hmm. Aquinas would not have <laughs> said that uh, because he wouldn't have had the, the kind of awareness of how the brain functions. But but he would not be surprised, I suspect, uh, by pointing to the fact that that uh, people uh, with with uh, substance abuse disorder uh, have neurochemical and trophic brain changes over time. That he, and, and I suspect that, that, that we can find that of a lot of different kinds of habits, not the, just those involving substances. Mm -hmm. uh, yes? I am wondering um, what your thoughts are on the idea that, or, or actually the reason that I am not enough of an expert on the phenomenon of wicked problems to, to, to make, give you, give you a, a, a well-informed answer to that. But, but I th what I think you're calling attention to is the fact that, that, that we, we, we don't make uh, moral judgments about people for having diabetes, although we do say that they are in some sense responsible if their eating habits continue to contribute to 
uh, the, 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 the uh, perpetuation or the worsening of their disease. Uh, <coughs> at some point, a person with type 2 diabetes has to, to change their behavior if they want to become healthy and live. Uh, and, and we make that a matter of agency. Yes, absolutely. Available to them sure, absolutely. So, yeah, I, I guess I'm trying to protect people. <laughs> oh, I think um, that I think that's perfectly um, fine. Yes, I, I I would protect them too. I mean, yeah. uh, the, a disproportionate number of them live in food deserts, or they don't have the economic means to uh, uh, eat healthy foods. Uh, I, I had uh, some students who. Uh, uh, I teach an ethics course to our physician assistant students. Uh, we have a graduate program in physician assistant, stu assistant studies. And uh, two of them had been working uh, with the Jesuit Volunteer Corps at a in a house in New Orleans. And uh, their project had been to teach uh, people uh, who, who were economically deprived and also who lived in food deserts to, to uh, eat healthy using uh, frozen and canned foods, uh, to rinse canned beans, for example, uh, uh, to use frozen vegetables and teach them to prepare those. Uh, and, and of course, they can do that much more cheaply than you can buy fresh produce and lean cuts. But you're absolutely right that. I get, I guess Oh, absolutely. But from it's from a religious standpoint, from a theological standpoint. <laughs> they, they, it, I think on the level of the church, on the level of the local institution, they often are. They're regarded as, uh, with a stigma. Uh, I don't think that suggesting that recovery includes transforming huge, their agency is judging them as as being immoral. I, I think that, that, and that's an important distinction that, that we're not saying about addiction that these people just need to muster the will to change. That's just not going to happen, we know that. Uh, but that over the long term, uh, as they develop new associations and new ways of thinking and seeing and living, um, that, that and as they begin to recover agency, uh, their lives are transformed by, by the, those new associations, those new ways of life. Uh, I, I would not be interest, be willing to make any kind of a blanket claim, for example, about medically assisted treatment, saying, well, no one should be on it, or uh, the most you should be on medically assisted treatment is eight weeks or three months or six months. I think that, that that's really a matter that is just purely what works for this particular patient uh, and given what kinds of uh, uh, auxiliary kinds of services and communal support they may have or not have. Obviously, having them not taking the opioids is, is, is a step forward and a kind of a first step. 